Today on this old house, our apprentices are learning how to do a wood shingled roof. And we've got ourselves an old fashioned barn raising. What happened to all this plumbing here? I've never seen anything like this before. There's already rot going on in that trunk. So what have you found up here? Well, a bit of a surprise. It's really the classic plumber's lament. Nice. See this main roof form? We're just going to pull that forward so it's even where this existing deck is. Definitely says mid-century modern. The money's in the detail. That is beautiful. I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to this old house here in Rhode Island where we've got two projects going on. The main one is in Jamestown and that is about 20 minutes from here. But this one is our idea house and it's an opportunity to try out new ideas and new technology. And today our electrician Ben Giles is in the basement installing some of that new technology. Hey Ben, good to see you again. Hey, Kevin. How's it going? All right. Well, you're making some progress, huh? Looks like you're pretty much wrapping up the rough wiring. Yeah, yeah. Just installing this panel and getting ready to close things in. All right. And so what's new about the panel you're trying out for us? Well, this is a panel that allows us to wire everything all at once. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to put in any temporary breakers and worry about rewiring with, you know, arc faults with pigtails on them and all this stuff that we usually have to worry about. All right. Well, hang on a second here. So pigtails, let's break that down. I mean, arc fault is a we basically need that now in every new house, right? Right, that's what's going to protect us against fires, uh, flash faults, things like that. And wire gets damaged, you get a little electrical jump into, between the two and boom, yes. you got a fire. Yep. And so what's the pigtail part though? I'm not familiar with that. So right, the pigtails on a, on a traditional panel would be a little extra wire that you actually have to physically, you know, you'd put it in the panel and you'd hook it into your neutral bus and that would feed this with a neutral so that we could then hook up the circuit to the arc fault breaker. So every one of these that's arc fault, does this hold for GFCI as well? Yes. A ground fault is stopping us from getting shocked if we've got a wet hand or something. Every one of those two breakers has got this pigtail? Yes. Which means nowadays this panel is going to be filled with these? Yeah, and it gets really tough to do a neat job with it too, so it's, it's kind of a pain. Okay, so what does this eliminate? I mean, if, if we get rid of this, how are you wiring it? Right, so this panel actually has a neutral bus that runs right through where you plug in the breakers. So that's kind of replacing this right here. Yeah, this, this gets replaced with this neutral pin here. Mm -hmm. uh, and the new style breakers that we're plugging in now accept that neutral and they plug right into a pre-wired set of lugs. Oh. So that we can just literally wire up the set of lugs and, you know, plug the breaker in. That's it. You just connected and wired that. Yep. Oh, that's amazing. So no pigtail. That's nice and neat. And uh, I'm seeing AFGF, so arc fault and ground fault. So is that telling me which one? Yeah, so when this goes into fault, it's going to figure out whether it's an arc fault, so a flash fault or a fire hazard type of fault, or a ground fault, which is going to be more like something if you were blow drying your hair next to a sink and you right. drop the hair dryer in the sink and touch this touch the faucet um, really good to know you guys can troubleshoot quickly and for the homeowner they don't have to come down here and try to you know by sight figure out which one of the breakers is tripped they're, they're gonna have a light telling them exactly oh, that's pretty cool so you just install that line them up all the way down yeah that's a pretty good looking breaker yeah yeah so it actually they they've made them good looking enough that they feel that uh, you know they should have a clear panel cover for it <laughs> no kidding and, uh, look at yeah. that so the door actually lets you look in there Yep. It's not such a bad feature either. So all of our breakers are going to be sticking out here eventually when you get that door on. Yep. And uh, we'll be able to look right in there. And, yep, uh, and it's white, so it's going to match the wall perfectly and yeah. kind of blend right in. Cool. All right. Well, I don't know what you're going to do with that, but uh, I like what I see there. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. All right. So the other day, you guys helped install the mineral wool insulation, five inches of it, on the roof. And then on top of that, you put 5 8 sheathing. On top of that, you used a self-sealing membrane so that if any nails penetrate it, water can't get into the roof. And if any shingles should blow off, water can't get in the house. You've also installed the copper drip edge and you tied it in with this self-sealing membrane. 
Now we're ready to install the shingles. Now, I like wood shingle roofs. I like the way they look. And I like the fact that when you put about a five to a five and a half inch reveal on a wood shingle roof, they're really strong against high winds. There's less chance of them blowing off. There is a couple of problems with wood that you have to be very careful of. See, if this shingle is wet, it gets wet when it rains. When it rains, it swells and gets tight like a wooden boat, and that's why it won't leak. But if these shingles lay on this roof like this, the underside can't dry out. So the sun will dry out the top, the bottom will stay wet, and they'll start to rot, and they'll also cup. So we have to solve that problem. And to solve that problem, we're actually going to use a breather material, a nylon matrix that you lay on the roof. The shingles will sit on that, and they'll actually sit on a bed of air underneath them, allowing them to dry, because the air can come up under here, and across the sides. That's how you make a wood shingle last. All right, so the first thing we want to do is install our matrix across the bottom. All right, so now we're going to roll this out and I'm going to staple it right to the roof sheeting. Now when you staple it, you want to staple it about 24 to 36 inch squares just to hold it in place to install our shingle. All right, you want to just cut it right off even with the drip edge. All right, now we're ready to get started. Let's have a couple of those shingles there, Kevin. Nope. And grab that gun up behind you. Okay, so now the trick to installing any roof shingle, it needs to overhang on the sides, about three quarters of an inch, and on the front leading edge, a wood shingle should be an inch and a half to an inch and three quarters from the face of the face board to the edge of the shingle. To do that, I just cut a two by four, lay it against the edge of the fascia board, and bring it up and bring my shingle up so we're even with that inch and a half. Now I'll just tack this shingle in place. I want to keep my nail up about six inches. Okay, so that's my starter. Now I have to lay another one on top because the first edge has to be doubled or tripled in some case, but we're only gonna double it here. Now I'm also gonna make sure I nail up, again, five, or six, five and a half to six inches. I wanna be higher than my reveal. Got, I gotta keep it back so I don't come out to the overhang. Put one and another one, and I wanna be three quarters to an inch from the edge, and the nail shouldn't be driven too deep. So you want to keep the nail up high like that so it grabs as much of the meat of the wood, lessening the chance for it to lift off. We're using a stainless steel nail ring shank, two and a quarter inches long. All right, so now we're going to put another one on. I want to space the shingle slightly to allow for the expansion of the shingle. Make it the same distance off the fascia board. A couple of nails. I want to make sure that I have a gap and I want to make sure I cover that gap by a minimum of an inch overlap. Space out my shingle about an eighth of an inch because I, when these shingles get wet, they're going to expand and get tight when they swell. Nail up about six or seven inches and nail it. Now we're ready for the next row and we want a five and a half inch reveal. So we're going to just strike a line right across and we'll take a shingle, bring it down, and again, I want to keep it on that line. I want the nail to be up about seven inches. Don't want to drive it too deep, but I want to be deeper than that. So I bring it down tight to the surface. Okay, now we'll have another one that will span the gap and keep me away from this edge about, that's perfect, about an inch to an inch and a half. Put it on my line, space it out about an eighth of an inch, just loosely touching it. And a couple more nails. Okay, now we're ready for the next row. Again, we want to make sure that it is three quarters of an inch over the edge. Keep it on my line. And then a couple more nails. 
All right, so what we've done is we've actually offset our shingles up. So that's enough for now. What we're gonna do is the same thing on the other side, making sure that our measurements are the same. To make sure the measurements are the same, I'm just gonna take a scrap shingle, I'm gonna make it even on the bottom, and I'm gonna mark the bottom of each one of the rows. And I can take that and transfer it down the other end, and we don't have to use our tape measure. Awesome. All right, let's go down there. Okay, good. Now we've built up four courses here to match the four courses down there. We want to make sure our first line, our starter course, is straight. So to do that, we're going to put a nail right here on the edge of the shingle. And I'm going to take a string line, attach it to that nail, and we're going to bring it all the way down to the other end, do the same thing, keep our string line tight, and then bring the shingles to the string line. All right, so now you guys are ready to lay your force, first course in all the way across the front of the roof. So you're gonna take them, bring them down, line it up with the string line, continue all the way down and nail them off and double up that first course. All ready to do it? All right, I'm gonna leave you guys to it. This is the basement for our addition. So everything in here is new, and that means that we have got rigid film insulation underneath the slab, and the foundation wall came pre-insulated as well. But right through here is the old house, and we always knew that we needed to add insulation if we want this home to get to net zero. This old basement always had these low ceilings, so whenever you came down, you had to kind of duck down. And Jeff, it also had all of the original mechanical equipment down here. So I remember the heating plant was down here. You had a washer and dryer too, right? Yeah, imagine doing laundry down here. No, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, everything was here. Obviously, water meter, it was an oil tank, yeah. boiler. So all of that came out, and we've made provision for, in the new basement right. for all the mechanicals. Oh. So this space will just become basically dormant space but right but it can be a place for the heat in this house to leave if we don't do something about it sure as we know heat will go through the walls even through the floor here so what's the yeah. protocol so basically we've <clears throat> attached a fairing strip two two rows of fairing strip around the perimeter of the existing wall and then we're going to uh, attach this uh, mineral wool to it nice. which gives us r8 and then we just hold it in place with another fairing strip in the, in the opposite direction. And as you said, n nothing's going back here. No one's really going to be in this side of the basement. So we don't have to be too fussy yeah, with how it looks. Yeah, not to look too pretty. We just want to stop that heat movement. All right. And then on the floor, look at you. Yeah, so the floor, we actually discovered that this was a good application. The same system we used on the wall becomes a good surfacing to go over this existing slab. Sheathing, insulation, this is a one piece. We've got the skin yep. on the entire outside of the house, sidewalls. and. Good right. enough for you just to put down? Right. And then we'll end up taping the seams and putting another layer of plywood down, and that'll kind of lock it down and clean it up. All right. Well, not the best place to work, but if we're going to get to net zero, this is what we got to do, what right? we got to do, yeah. Okay. Sounds All like right. a plan. All right, Mary, we're at a critical part of the job when we have to start thinking about finishes. Now, that may sound a little silly because the electrician hasn't finished his wiring, the plumber hasn't been here yet, there's no lights, but we have to think about finishes. And what I mean by finishes, I'm talking about is it going to be wainscoting? Where are the cabinets going to go? Is there going to be any crown molding? And a good framer will take a look at the finishes when he's framing the plans to make it easier for the finish to find structure. So let's look at this layout right here. Here's our kitchen cabinets right here as our sink goes to this window. In this wall right here, we have our range hood and cabinets on each side. If I take that and I hold the plans against the wall right there, so now we can see the orientation right here. And on this layer, we have a range here, we have a hood above it, and we have one cabinet. And that cabinet is about nine inches from that opening in is where it begins, and it's 18 inches wide. So why don't you hold your tape measure at nine inches, 
and from that nine inches, I'll measure 18 inches. Now look what we have. We have nothing to screw the cabinet to here and nothing to screw the cabinet to here. We only have one stud. One stud to screw the bottom and one stud to screw the top. Not good because you got to think about the weight of the cabinet. What's going to go in those cabinets? You never know. Let's say dishes. Well, that's heavy. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to put blocking in between each stud cavity, the height plus a little on the bottom, and tight to the ceiling because we know the cabinets are going to the ceiling. So we know our cabinets are 36 inches. Why don't you measure up 38? I'll measure up 38, and we'll just snap a straight line. All right, so now take the line, put it on your mark, and I'll bring it over here. I want to make it nice and tight. I'm going to pull it hard. You got it? Yes, sir. All right, so that's where we're going to put our blocking. Now we're ready to take our measurements. So I want you to measure between the bay so we can cut our first piece. What I don't want you to do is measure up there. The reason is, is because you never know about framing stock. You think about conditions with rain, sun. This framing stock could bow just a little bit. So the smartest place to take the measurement is where it doesn't move, and that's right at the base. I see. All right? So you take a measurement there, whatever that number is. 11 and 2 eighths. Okay. So now let's put it on this and we can make this cut. Now this is just some scrap wood. We also want to make sure that our first cut is square, which it is and make your measurement. All right, get the saw, put your safety glasses on, and make a cut. Now there's a pivot point right there, so put it on there. Now you can pivot it right in, and that'll stop it square, and slide it over to the line, hold it firm, and cut it. All right, now let's grab the piece and see how it fits. All right, now look at that. It's too short, right? Well, it isn't too short. Let's try it down there. Perfect. See, because this stud must have a little bit of a bow in it that you can't notice. But you notice it when you cut the dimension wrong. I see. All right, so now let's take a measurement for the second one. Okay. Now the second one, just lay this one right down here because okay. that one's going to go into place. Okay. Now let's take the second piece and measure that, only you're not going to measure it. You're just going to take the wood right over. We're going to use the square edge that you've already cut. You're going to lay it down close to the floor, put it against it, and mark it. Okay. Now what I like to do is, I, if you mark up like this, you have a crooked line. Mm -hmm. All right. Now you take that over to the table and you cut on this part of the line. That would be way too long. Okay. If you were to cut and use that part of the line, it would be perfect. But to know exactly where you're going to cut, you're going to just make a little ding mark like that, and you bring it off. So now you have a point or an arrow tip to know exactly where I want to make my cut. I see. Got it? All right. Perfect. All right. So let's see how that fits. So now look at that. That's perfect. All right. Let's get the next piece. Okay. All right, so now we're going to take the pieces and I'm going to put it on the line. And I want you to put two screws in through the stud on that side. Okay. All right, so now on this one, we're going to pull it in tight. Okay. And you're going to toenail it from here. Okay. Good. Okay. Now we'll do the next one. Same thing. Okay. To get the net zero, we need to put solar panels on this roof, and ideally those panels would face due south, but your roof line's not really cooperating with you here, is it, Doc? No, Kevin, and we've got a north-south ridge, which gives us slopes in the wrong direction, and even if it were in the right direction, I don't want to put solar on the street side. Right. So your plan is? To build a big barn in the back with a long south-facing roof. A roof big enough for the array you need? Very close to what we need. All right, well, you got your tool belt. You're going to help us raise this barn? I'm ready to. Let's go. Hey, Paul. Hi, Kevin. So what are we calling this? Prefab, pre-cut? What are you building for us? It's a pre-engineered, pre-cut post and beam barn kit. All right. Yeah, so we manufacture this at our facility in Connecticut. We ship it out to site. All the parts are pre-cut and color-coded. They correspond with the color-coded plans. We spend the day working with the customer and his carpenters and 
hopefully get this salt box frame raised. All right, well, you're going to be working with uh, an architect and me as well, so we'll try not to slow you down. All right. So when you say posted beam, Paul, you weren't messing around. You guys aren't faking it, huh? No, this is the real traditional way of doing a post and beam barn. So we've got traditional joinery with the mortise and tenon. Yes, sir. You've got your pegs that already have already gone in. And right. what is our species of wood? We're working with eastern white pine here, all stamped and graded. And, and this dimension is? This is a full dimension 6x8 post and a full dimension 6x10 tie beam. All right. So post beam, posts, you guys call those bents in a traditional barn, That's right? That's correct. There'll be three of them in this building. Awesome. And this one goes where? This one goes on the far wall. Ready to lift? It's ready to raise. Let's After this, we'll do the center one and then the last one. All right. Let's get it up. So your knee braces here, those are temporary. Those are just temps, right. That's just for the lift? Correct. To, to, to square it up so that we can peg it. Yeah. That's what that's basically for. And for the lift to keep it rigid. So what's he doing right now? Right now they're just going to temporarily tack the post to the sill. They're going to temporarily brace it and plumb it. And how are you fastening it to the slab? What we have is below the floor is a concrete pier that goes 42 inches below grade to a footing. And there's a number five rebar in the top of that pier and a hole in the bottom of the post. Love yeah, it. really nice job. Right. Well, we appreciate, appreciate it very help. much. Thank you. All right, All right. We'll All right. see you. She's All right. in your hands now, Jeff. You got to bring her the rest of the way, right? Yep. Goes up oh, fast, boy. too. Oh, my God. What a day. Yeah. That's amazing. That's good. And we've got plenty more coming next week. We're actually going to use some new technology to seal up this house for air infiltration, but we're going to do it from the inside. So until then, I'm Kevin O'Connor. And I'm Jeff Sweener. For this old house here in Rhode Island. So you get a timber frame in a day. Not bad, right? Next time on This Old House. New technology will stop air infiltration on our entire project. Just got a head start here. And how long will it take to pressurize and seal it all up? About 90 minutes. And we put the finishing touch on a wall system that's seven layers deep. So Tommy, what's the total R value that the system gives us? The total R value is almost 30 right here. I mean, and so this is a very strong wall assembly yeah. when we're going towards that net zero. That's next time on This Old House.